Hi, and welcome to the um, webinar today. I'm very, very um, pleased to welcome Courtney Walton, who's joining us today. Just to give you a little bit of background, Courtney um, and his colleagues published a study, Cognitive Training for Freezing of Gait in Parkinson's Disease, a randomised control trial. And this was published back in 2015. Uh, and it's generated quite a lot of discussion on our Facebook group around the cognitive training program that was actually implemented. So I thought it would be fantastic to get Courtney on the line and ask him a little bit more about the approach, um, the cognitive training approach that was used and kind of takeaway points that we could use both as clinicians, but also, you know, for yourself listening, what you might do to um, enhance your cognition um, and maybe improve your freezing of gait at home. So Courtney, you're a provisional psychologist currently. You're up in Queensland, so hopefully a little bit warmer than down here in Sydney. I've still got the scarf on and it's free. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the study that you did was actually um, funded by the Michael J. Fox Foundation, so yep. that's great. Yeah, that's Fan great. Fantastic. And what, what was it that got you into this um, area and Parkinson's in, specific, uh, in particular? Yeah, so I... Um, in my kind of undergraduate studies in, in my final year, um, we had a lecture on, on kind of late life cognitive decline and dementia. Um, and it really kind of just struck something. I just became very interested in, in that area. And so um, when I did my honours year, I, I kind of went in and started doing some cognitive training work in, in older adults. Mm -hmm. um, found that very interesting and then kind of got in contact with a few different people um, for my PhD around around Australia and Simon's group, uh, along with Professor Sharon Naismith, they they kind of um, just seemed like a really great group to work with, and they had this idea for for running cognitive training in Parkinson's, um, this kind of new novel novel study that hadn't been done before. So um, yeah, it just seemed like a great opportunity and something that, that interested me. So mm -hmm. made the move up from Melbourne to Sydney, and and that was in 2013. So we ran that study for uh, up until 2016. Right. Um, and then that was actually published this year. Yeah, yeah fantastic. Um, and tell me, I mean, cog cognitive issues are a big deal for people with Parkinson's. It concerns a lot of people and the stats, depending on the literature that you're reading, are quite high, even in the early stages of diagnosis. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about what people with Parkinson's experience, what are the mild cognitive impairments that they experience and what do you think is the underlying pathophysiology behind that? Yeah, so it's cognitive decline in Parkinson's is a really um, kind of common symptom that people are worried about and people notice some changes. Um, and so we see quite a spectrum in terms of how that looks in Parkinson's and it's something that kind of for all symptoms we say and that everyone presents so differently. Um, what we know is that people with Parkinson's can, can kind of range from completely you know, quote unquote normal cognition um, for their age. And then we also see people who are kind of noticing some changes in their day to day life that they're worried about. But then when we get them in the lab and do some tests, they're actually performing quite normally. Right. Um, so that's kind of the subjective cognitive decline we see. Um, and then that kind of moves on from there to, to what we call mild cognitive decline. So this is where people, you know, we get them to do some tests to look at their, their memory, their attention and so on. Um, and they're actually performing slightly worse than you might expect for someone of their age and education level. But it's not at a point that it's really um, hindering their day-to-day -day life. It's, it's not impacting their work and their social relationships. Um, it's, it's more a kind of lab-based deficit. Um, and, and the sorts of changes we typically see, and again, this varies a lot, in Parkinson's, it seems to be more um, associated with things like what we call executive functions, so things like planning, um, problem solving. Uh, we also see some kind of problems with attention, visuospatial, so things like things in our environment, um, judging distance. Uh, we see those kind of changes more than things like memory. However, yeah. we do also see some memory concerns in, in a number of um, patients. And then, you know, that can progress um, in some people and it doesn't in a lot onto, you know, a Parkinson's disease dementia where it's, it's kind of a much more substantial deficit that's actually really impacting on, on people's day-to-day -day life. Um, yeah. So, um, What was it that um, led you to consider the cognitive impairments and how that would impact on freezing of gait? What, what was it that led you to that 
so that's that's kind of a body of work that um, Professor Simon Lewis has kind of been leading um, and, and something that our team was working quite a lot on. And so what we have kind of shown is that people, when you get groups of people that do have freezing and you compare them to people that don't have groups of freezing, uh, the group that don't have freezing, they seem to have quite different cognitive profiles. So people with freezing tend to have more severe problems with these kind of um, switching attention between things, the kind of speed of thinking. And what we think is that it's actually to do with that underlying pathology of freezing. And what we believe happens is that there's almost this kind of bottleneck that happens with freezing with that lower dopamine. And when we have um, kind of lots of things going on and we're trying to process lots of different things, so for example, people who are walking and, and talking, um, it almost overloads the system. And then at a neural level, that actually leads to a kind of blockage mm -hmm. um, and, a, and a kind of inability to progress forward and keep that movement. And so the idea with, with the cognitive training is that, well, perhaps through cognitive training, we can improve the processing of some of those regions of the brain, those kind of frontal, frontostrasal regions. And by improving the processing of those regions, potentially that can alleviate or or kind of give the brain more ability to cope with that overload mm -hmm. and, and reduce the severity of freezing. Okay, so can you tell us a little bit more about the pathophysiology of cognitive impairments and how, I guess you've talked about the deficits of the frontostriatal region. Um, there's obviously um, memory issues in some people and that can be related to atrophy in the hippocampal area, but mm. is there anything else that you can tell us a little bit more just to clarify what goes on with cognitive impairments um, and again, relating that back to the freezing of gait. Yeah, so um, I'll be the first to say it's probably not my area of, of specialty um, in terms of the pathophysiology, but um, what we know is that, you know, there's, there's a whole number of changes that occur in, in Parkinson's and the, the fundamental is that um, reduced dopamine that's affecting the processing of those regions. We also see kind of Lewy bodies and um, pathology in the kind of uh, mid layer, um, so the kind of limbic regions, the basal ganglia, um, and that is going to have an impact on, on how well cognitive processes can occur. What we also know is that quite a, a high number of people with Parkinson's disease will actually um, present post mortem with Alzheimer pathology, um, and that will be more in the kind of cortical regions, and, and that may be some of the reason why. We see some changes in memory, kind of a, a subset of people with Parkinson's. Um, but it's it's a pretty uh, diverse and, and kind of complicated area, um, and and that can kind of lead to why we see such different changes uh, in terms of performance for, for people with Parkinson's. Yeah, and so what is the um, I guess the concept behind cognitive training? How what's the hypothesis to how you can improve the processing speed? How, how did you think that you could do that and achieve that? And then what did you actually do? Yeah, so, so the area of cognitive training kind of comes from this observation that um, on, on a kind of population level, um, when we look at people that are kind of engaged in more cognitively stimulating activity throughout life, these as a group tend to have lower levels of cognitive decline, lower levels of dementia and kind of better cognitive performance. And so, you know, that might be things through engaging in, in higher levels of education. It might be kind of more cognitively stimulating um, jobs per se. Uh, and also engaging in kind of more cognitively stimulating hobbies and activities in, in daily life. So it's kind of speaking to that use it or lose it hypothesis that you always hear people talking about. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's basically the idea that by using these areas of the brain regularly and um, at a high level, it, it kind of requires them to stay functioning at a more healthy, healthy level. And there is kind of that neural evidence to, to support that hypothesis. Um, and so the idea with cognitive training is, well, can we um, provide that cognitive stimulation in a, in a kind of more structured way? Um, so cognitive training typically presents as computerized exercises that are targeting specific cognitive abilities. And by taking part in these exercises in a kind of progressive, um, more and more complex way, 
we're kind of challenging the brain to be able to process that information and see if that can lead to kind of an ongoing change that will then translate into daily life. With the um, key being progressive uh, challenges, I guess. Yeah, definitely. So um, what you don't want is to get good at something and then to keep doing that. What you want to do is, is constantly challenge yourself, constantly be, once you get to a certain level, raising that bar a bit higher and, and constantly challenging yourself to, to work a little bit harder. Um, and so that, that's typically how a cognitive training program will run. Um, and it may be that we're looking at all sorts of things or it may be a more kind of focus we want to try and improve this one cognitive ability. Mm -hmm. So I guess um, in terms of, of how that's looked in Parkinson's so far, we've seen that it does seem to be quite effective. Um, we actually ran a, a meta-analysis. So basically what we do is look at all the studies that have done cognitive training in Parkinson's, pull all of the results together um, and, and look at it at a kind of higher level. And what we see is that in Parkinson's studies, um, we've seen significant and quite large changes to things like working memory, um, things like executive functions, so the planning and so on that I just mentioned, and also um, attention. Mm -hmm. So that kind of gave us good evidence to suggest that running this in, in our group could be effective. I apologise that someone's decided to mow the lawn right outside of my house. Oh, that's all right. <laughs> you can send them down to our place. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I guess going, going back to the freezing, I think was your question, is so because we could see that people with freezing appear to have these kind of quite specific cognitive changes and we think that that's associated with why freezing can occur, we wanted to design a program that targeted those changes to the brain specifically. Mm -hmm if that could alleviate some of the symptoms of freezing. Um, and tell me, with the, the actual programs that you use, I understand that they're probably pr proprietary um, software programs, but the methodology behind them, obviously it would have focused on specific domains of cognition. And yeah. tell us a little bit about the learning difficulties that people with Parkinson's may experience and how that was dealt with in the cognitive training. Yeah, so we used a range of programs. Um, the reason being that we wanted to really focus on, on those skills that I've just talked about. So we took from different programs what we thought was relevant. I think one of the key things with cognitive training, um, and this comes from kind of the wider research, is that it appears to be much more effective when it's facilitated in a in a kind of environment where you have someone like a psychologist or an occupational therapist actually helping people engage with those exercises. Mm -hmm. And so definitely in our groups, we found that. We found that a lot of the exercises that we were asking people to do are, you know, they're challenging, they're difficult. And so um, myself and, and Dr. Lauren Majowski, who's a, a neuropsychologist at, at the Brain and Mind Centre, we were kind of facilitating those sessions and when we could see that someone was having some difficulty with a, a particular exercise, um, we had the ability to come and sit with them and, and kind of work through that exercise and offer some assistance, offer some tips, offer, you know, that increase in motivation. Um, and that's something that really separates a program like ours to um, cognitive training at home on your own, um, which, which can be tricky to, to translate. Purely because of the... Um, well, do you think obviously it's the persistence, but overall, does that lead to increase of dosage and progression, whereas yeah. it might lead to abandonment at home? Yeah, that's what we think. Um, there's, there's strong evidence that people who, who do cognitive training at home do not get the benefits um, right. that people in the lab do. And we think that that's probably because, one, they may not be training for as long as they would in a, in a group with um, psychologists kind of helping them. Yep. Secondly, we think that people probably tend to focus on the things they're good at and shy away from the things that are tricky. And that, you know, that's... You know, Fair that's, enough. That's normal. <laughs> um, but, you know, if you're at home on your own and this exercise is very difficult, it's much easier to say, I'm going to skip this one and do the one I like, yeah. as opposed to when you say, I'm struggling with this, can you offer me a bit of assistance? And then someone can come and help you through it. Um, so... That's kind of a real difficulty with cognitive training because yeah. 
at this point in time, there's, there's not really great options for people to get, have access to that, um, to have kind of someone to help them through these exercises. And typically cognitive training is sold to the public as something to do at home for 10 yeah. minutes on the couch, while, you know, while half chatting to someone, half watching TV. And we don't think that that's an effective way to do cognitive training. So do you think there's a middle ground, like for people that want to learn languages or do Sudoku or, you know, they talk, there's a lot of talk about social participation and engagement through those capacities. Do you think there's still merit in that? Perhaps it may not be as effective, but. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and there is evidence that those kind of things are beneficial. Um, so taking part in all of those activities are great and certainly not doing harm. On it. And it is. Yeah. Um, going to have benefits. I think it's more so for a program like ours that had very specific targets. Um, that was something where facilitating that in the clinic was helpful. However, um, you know, that, that is possible at home, but I think being aware of some of those, those limitations and trying to kind of notice when that happens yeah. um, is probably kind of the middle ground there. And coming back to your study, so just in terms of the actual protocol itself, you had a program running for seven weeks. People came in uh, in the intervention group for two hours a week, twice a week, of which uh, it looked like there was one hour of that two-hour period actually spent on the cognitive yeah. training. The other hour was on education, yeah. essentially. So um, do you think, on, in hindsight, that dosage was sufficient? Was there anything that you might have changed after the fact? Uh, no, I, th I think that's probably a good level. I think the evidence uh, appears to show that around two to three sessions a week is kind of the, the perfect point. Um, too much more than that seems to not have an effect and too much less also doesn't seem to have an effect. So I think the reason we chose that was um, an hour seems to be about the range where you're kind of getting enough, but you're not overloading. And, and we, we saw that once you get into the kind of the 55th mm. minute, people are starting to really a little bit tired and drained and it kind of was a good point to cut it and the reason we combined it with the psychoeducation was um you know multifaceted for a start people are coming in and, and we wanted to kind of offer them more we wanted to give them information about all sorts of things also a lot of these people were coming in with family members they were helping them get in and so offering those people um something in terms of those groups was also useful yeah yeah um Okay, and I guess as a clinician, based on the study and the research that you've done, as a physio and OTs that might be listening as well, what do you think would be the key take-home messages for us? Uh, obviously, cognitive training in a rehab setting is, is crucial, opposed to setting and prescribing homework for patients to go and do. We've obviously talked about that not being as effective. Um, but how do you think the cognitive training really differs from the cognitive compensations that might also uh, be often taught. So note writing, uh, to-do lists, diaries and workout logs. I mean, is there, there's still a place for all of that, obviously? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, what's great about this kind of whole non-pharmacological kind of treatments is very unlikely that any of these is going to have a negative effect. Mm -hmm. Um, and some people need both. So, you know, those, those compensation strategies are, are incredibly useful for kind of day to day, um, things right so so for making sure that, that we're getting those things done in the way that we need them done i think cognitive training is slightly different and that it's actually trying to get at the process um within the brain that allows yeah. us to do these things whereas those compensation strategies are more okay so we have a bit of a deficit here how are we going to get around uh, our daily lives coping with that deficit that we have so i think probably um both of those are going to be very useful um, and, and doing both is probably the way to go. I think in terms of um, how to do cognitive training outside of, of a rehab center or outside of a clinic, and if you have patients who want to do this sort of thing, I think the advice is that, um, as we've kind of touched on, trying to do it for, for about 45 minutes or so, um, a couple of times a week, we would recommend that people really give it the full attention. So a lot of people will talk about doing cognitive training at home, but what they'll be doing is they'll be sitting on the couch, they'll be mm. uh, doing it in between conversations, they might have the TV on, they might be talking to their partner. Um, what we would really recommend is to give it 
the full attention and to really treat it like a, a proper treatment that they're doing. Um, and also to kind of keep at it. So it's, it's inevitable that people will have difficulties with some of these exercises, that the whole point of them is that they are difficult and that they are challenging. And so just being aware of the fact that it does, it is tempting to kind of skip those exercises that you find more difficult, but um, you know, there's no, there's no uh, points for getting high scores or anything. You, you yeah. know what I mean? In the real life, it's all just about your engagement with that activity and, and your kind of pushing through those tricky exercises. So even if you're maybe not scoring as well and, and you feel like you're not doing as well as you want to, it's still definitely a, a massive um, use, use for you going forward in terms of challenging those skills. Yeah. And I guess coming back to the, the way that you um, uh, selected your, your patient cohort, you were talking about freezing of gait and essentially um, people were broken up into groups based on cognitive skill or cognitive impairment at the beginning. Mm. Can you tell us about that involvement and in future or on, in hindsight, how you might have changed the groups again or stratified them differently? Yeah, yeah. So that's something we mentioned in our, our discussion of the paper is potentially um, something we might do differently in the future. So in terms of how the actual program run, what we did is we, we kind of put the word out to people who experienced freezing of gait to come and take part in the study. Um, we wanted people without a diagnosis of dementia. Um, and we got them to do a number of kind of cognitive tests we got them to do some walking tests, so where we'd ask them to walk back and forth and do things like some mass equation while they're walking. And we would film this and then kind of do a very kind of detailed second by second analysis of how much freezing we observed. So mm -hmm. that gave us a good idea of how they were tracking at the start. And a proportion of those people we also did neuroimaging with. Um, so that is a second part of this study, which is to be, to be finalized. Um, and then from there, we split these people into two groups and we split them based on their cognitive ability so that we had kind of an even match so that they were quite similar across the groups and their ability to engage with the cognitive training. That was kind of the reason behind that. So the two groups were matched in basically every way. Um, they both came in for two hours twice a week. They both used computers. They both were facilitated by myself and Lauren, the other psychologist. Um, the difference was what they did on those computers. So one group was doing very broad, uh, general cognitive activity. So they were kind of watching um, educational videos and, and responding to quizzes about that. So it's kind of more memory based. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was our control group. And the treatment group was doing much more focused cognitive training on, on the things we've mentioned, so executive function and so on. And so then at the end of that seven weeks, we got everyone back together, they did all of those tests, and, and it was that uh, freezing test where they were walking where we found the changes. I think what we thought going forward was that um, it may have actually been better to split the groups based on their severity of freezing. Mm -hmm. um, just so Rather than we, the cognitive skill. Yeah, um, just, just purely from a statistical standpoint so that we had a bit more of an even, even balance there. But I think a key thing was that we had a number of people who experienced freezing and definitely have freezing, but they didn't actually freeze yeah. at that first session. And so that leaves a bit of a tricky situation there. Uh, you know, we obviously want to offer them this program mm -hmm. because they do appear to have freezing. But in terms of our study, they have no freezing at the beginning. So that was a bit of a tricky thing. We chose to, to use those people in our study. Um, so they did the program and what we showed was that we got the improvement in freezing when we only looked at people who actually had freezing at the beginning of the study. Right. But we also found improvements when we included those people who didn't mm -hmm. freeze at the beginning. So it was a reliable finding. Um, but I think maybe for other researchers going forward, that might be a good way to um, do, do that. Yeah. Separation of groups. So where do you see the future of cognitive training going uh, for people with Parkinson's? I think it's, I think it's really positive. I think um, I was actually only recently reading a, a you know, big kind of paper from the leaders in the field about cognition in Parkinson's and Parkinson's and the last line 
actually said, you know, cognitive training looks like a promising mm. um, aspect for people with Parkinson's to go down. So I'm aware that kind of more and more studies are starting to happen. When we did that meta-analysis of all the studies, there were only seven in the world. Mm -hmm. um, that was a couple of years ago, and I think there's been a number published since then, and there's quite a few ongoing. So I think we're learning more and more and more about how to implement cognitive training in people with Parkinson's. As I said, I think at this point, the kind of facilitated route may be more beneficial, but I think there is definitely um, scope because it is more feasible to do at home and we completely mm. understand that. Um, there is scope to do those studies, but I think educating people on some of the, the pitfalls yeah. of, of that approach to maybe nip them in the bud early so people are aware of, of kind of where you can go wrong and try and, try and correct for that. Because yeah. Parkinson's is a, is a disorder that's associated with, you know, mobility issues. And, and so we, the benefit of cognitive training is that it is um, scalable and it, it can be done anywhere. Yeah. It's just how do we get people to do that? And, and there is actually an interesting study going on at the University of Sydney at the moment in collaboration with a lot of other universities where they're using this information for people, um, not with Parkinson's, but for older adults, where they're doing cognitive training at home, however, they're having online supervision. Yeah. So almost like this. Um, and so they can actually have people supervise their training from home and get that, that benefit both socially and also in terms of the strategies for doing the exercises. So that could potentially be um, a really exciting thing going forward. Yeah, right. Fantastic. And I think um, obviously you were looking specifically at freezing of gait, but your cognitive training you would expect would have improvements in cognitive um, executive function, attention, mm -hmm. memory, learning, I guess, to a degree, which would have a direct impact on how people live their lives and their activities of daily living, etc. cetera. Yeah. 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 So we did measure these things. Um, what we saw, unfortunately, was while we got um, definitely trending results, so all of the tests that we would anticipate um, the, the cognitive training group to improve in, they did compare to the control group. Mm -hmm. However, statistically, this wasn't significant for um, most of them other than sleep. Mm -hmm. And that's basically a limitation of this work is that the sample was quite small. So we ended up with 20 people in each group that we ran the analyses on. And so... Um, there is potential that if we had a, a larger sample, that, that may have been, um, we would have, would have had more statistical power to, to look at that. Um, so we can't really speak, we can't really say yes or no for that, but it does appear that it, it did kind of push the bar a little bit towards improvements on things like executive function. Um, there's one test in particular that people with freezing typically have a lot of difficulty with, and that's called the trail making test. And anyone that's come to our clinic will, will be familiar with that, where you're joining 1A, 2B, 3C, and so on, switching mm -hmm. between numbers and letters. And people in that cognitive training group had quite a big reduction in the time it took them to do that, whereas in the control group they didn't. Yeah. Um, but we couldn't speak on that because it wasn't statistically significant. So yeah, that's something for kind of future studies to get bigger samples and see if that's a more reliable finding. In terms of activities of daily living, that's another kind of similar thing where, where it kind of had that trend, but it wasn't statistically significant. Um, and that's kind of the key thing for cognitive training studies, I think, going forward is we find quite reliable improvements in the lab in terms of um, measuring cognition, mm -hmm. but we don't currently have a great way to assess what difference is this making in people's lives outside of the lab. Um, and that's something that you know, I think only better measures of, of assessing that can figure out. Um, and, and that's kind of an exciting thing going forward is, is what sorts of results can we find in that space? I see, I mean, w you didn't mention it, but I know that it was in your study as well about the PDQ39 and the quality of life measure. You'd almost expect that there would be an improvement in quality of life with an improvement in cognitive function, but it, it wasn't played out against clinically, um, statistically significant in the paper. But I mean, from my understanding, it would take more of the health coaching, the self-efficacy, uh, 
more of that aspect to probably drive that. But what mm. do you think? Yeah, I think so. I think um, that's a questionnaire that, you know, there's only a few questions in there that would specifically relate to changes um, to do with freezing or cognition. So you would need a very strong effect on those couple of questions and you would need it in a lot of people to really notice it. So while I believe there was a slight reduction, so an improvement in mm. quality of life, it wasn't large enough to kind of um, be labelled as a significant result. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think, you know, it's, it's not um, scientifically enough, but in terms of our kind of interactions with participants and their family members, we got such positive feedback um, in terms of what people noted um, for their changes in cognitive, cognitive ability, freezing, but also kind of confidence um, and social engagement. We think that, yeah, everyone in both groups actually gave really yeah. good feedback. In terms I'd expect of, both groups would have... Well, that's it, because the, the control group, um, you know, they're still taking part in a group of, of other people with Parkinson's, their family members, they're still engaging in cognitively mm. challenging activities that are trying to improve aspects of their functioning, just not the kind of underlying aspects that we think are related to freezing. So we still kind of expected them to have changes in, in mood, quality of life, yeah. uh, and enjoyment in the program. Um, and just a quick question on medication, because I didn't notice it in there, but did you notice any changes in medication at all in the experimental group? No, so we, we didn't, but something that I, I should have mentioned in terms of the medication, so we actually tested people when, when they were taking their medications, and then we yep. also asked people to come back in and do these walking tests without their medications. Mm -hmm. And so what we showed that while we had this quite significant improvement when people were on their medication, uh, there was no change after the program when they were off their medication. So that kind of suggests that potentially the brain becomes, um, you know, when there's no dopamine, when that's not being supplemented by medication, the kind of changes that we may have initiated through training um, can't fight against that. It's kind of too much. Yeah. Um, and so we, we didn't think that was too much of a limitation because it's quite, you know, typically people are taking yeah. medication. And it's, it's kind of an unnatural thing for us to ask them to not take it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it does appear that kind of that ongoing medication is needed still to see the changes of this cognitive training. It's certainly not a, an alternative. It's, it's yeah. a complementary um, thing, just like physiotherapy and, and so on. And did you notice any other changes in other medications that people might have been taking for depression or anxiety or any other mood change or uh, sleeping problem? No, we don't. We didn't actually get a recording of those kinds of um, medications, so that's another um, kind of limitation of that work. Um, but as far as I'm aware, in terms of talking to people, they they didn't have those those changes to their medications. Yeah. yeah. All right, Courtney. Can, is there anything else that you wanted to share about the paper? I mean, it was it was really interesting to read. I think, as I said, we had a lot of engagement and. Uh, interest in the paper itself and the clinical application of the the knowledge generated yeah. from this anything else you wanted to add no i guess just keep an eye out because um so dr moran gillat who lots of people in sydney who come to our clinic may know him he just finished his phd as well and he's now in leven in belgium working on on some similar sorts of things in terms of parkinson's um and he's actually going to be exploring the the kind of neuroimaging findings from this study so as I mentioned, people in this study actually did some brain scans and we got them to do some walking in the scanner, hmm. uh, which is a kind of clever kind of way of working this out that Simon Lewis has, has come up with. Um, and so he will actually be looking at, is there a change in the brain that corresponds to the change in freezing mm -hmm. um, as a result of this training? So that's something we're really looking forward to, to kind of finding out in the near future. So yep. hopefully there's a kind of part two to this paper to come. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for your time today um, and enjoy you. your sunny weather up in Queensland. It's too hot already. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks no, so much. Bye now. Okay. Bye.